We're very fortunate, of course, to have Hannah Pingree here. She is now the head of the, the department. The whatever it is, <laughs> Who knows? it's some sort of uh, policy innovation in the future agenda for the There's governor. There's a large crystal ball in our office. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so before we get to your off-island work these days, I just thought it would be helpful to get people grounded in where you're from. And uh, you know, I know on island you wear a lot of hats. Can you talk a little bit about where you've been and what you've been focused on in recent years? Sure. Uh, well, I live on the island of North Haven, which is the island that I grew up on. It's where I've lived for most of my life. Um, and it's where I've spent uh, the last, I don't know, a lot of years since I left college and left New York City and came back to Maine as both a state representative, Speaker of the House, and then I was term limited as Speaker. I went home, I had young kids, and I've been living really year round on North Haven for the last 10 years. And I think I'm sure there are many offshore islanders in this audience. Um, just like people in Maine, when you live in a small community, you get involved into a lot of things. So um, this, this new job I've taken on has allowed me to sort of step away from some of the things. But um, living on the island, I've been chair of the school board, run our housing organization, been on the board of the community center, run a farm, an inn, uh, and I've had to be on your board. So <laughs> among other things. Thank you for that. Yeah. So when you're on the island, I'm curious about kind of what you bring with you when you leave. So I know just from having had the opportunity to meet your brother and sister and your mom and dad, you know, they're, you're a group of your family that has been very entrepreneurial, very civically oriented. You know, what is it when you leave the island that most that you bring with you every day? The inability to say no, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Um, no, I think, I mean, again, I think that Maine has this attitude and spirit, and it's especially true on an island. You know, you have the, the sense that problems don't fix themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you understand what the community problems are, what the community opportunities are, and if you don't do it, or your family doesn't do it, or you don't encourage your neighbors to do it, it's not going to happen. And so that's sort of been the driving force of, of my life. It's what I saw my parents do mm -hmm. um, as I was growing up in, on the island. And it's certainly, um, you know, even how I view what we in Maine need to do, what state mm -hmm. government needs to do. I mean, we have a lot of challenges, but they're not going to solve themselves. Mm -hmm. And they require us to be incredibly proactive, uh, be creative, but also figure out how to bring the community, in this case, the big community together around solving them. So one of the things that I think I'd be worried about if I was on North Haven is that your time and energy, perhaps, for North Haven may end up getting compromised by your new role. So how do you go about identifying or supporting new leaders in your community so that they can step up behind everything that you've been doing all these years? We heard about that on the panel, yeah. that it's a challenge and that it's a need. Yeah, again, it's a need. It's certainly a need on offshore islands. It's a need across Maine. Uh, North Haven is one of the relatively, um, one of the islands that has more young people um, mm -hmm. who have stayed on the island or moved back to the island. So uh, I've been trying to suck them into the things I'm involved with, and now I'm trying mm -hmm. to pass some things off to them. Um, I have an amazing sister who uh, runs a small business on North Haven called Caldwood Hall. It's a restaurant, pizza uh, place. She's a landlord. So I'm I'm shuffling a few of my things off to her. Mm -hmm. She's a little not as happy about. Um, but no, I mean, I think uh, everyone in the small community, I mean, you, you pass on, hopefully you set a good example, hopefully you start things that can continue after you're gone. Mm -hmm. And you know, luckily we have a number of young parents, a number of young community members who will step up. But everything, it's really hard work. So things are always fragile. I mean, just kind of like they are in Maine. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I, this is an awesome opportunity I couldn't pass up. So one of the things you told me that has stuck with me for a number of years is that sometimes what we forget to do in our communities is to actually sit down and talk with the people that you think have the capacity to lead and yeah. encourage them. And I've always found that to be so simple and straightforward and something that anyone can do. And I think it's often overlooked. And so I just wanted to share that. I think yeah. it's a really important element of the way that you foster leadership. I know you talk about dragging people or pulling people to do it, but I have also worked with a number of your friends and neighbors who 
are leading because you sat down with them and you said, I think you've got what it takes. Yeah, I mean, Suzanne's question to the last panel, I mean, that is sort of what we all have to be doing all the time, is mm -hmm. asking other people to step up, telling them we think that they would be good. Um, I talked you into starting that leadership program <laughs> years ago. And I'm a good listener. I forgot the name of it, but it was awesome. I lead. I lead, yeah. And we convinced all these um, young islanders to consider starting businesses, organizations, of which a lot of cool things came out of. Yeah. Out of that came um, a woman who did a business plan for an elder care facility on North Haven, which then came back to haunt me because I had to spend three <laughs> years fundraising for this elder mm -hmm. care facility on North Haven, but it turned out to be an awesome project. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The four inaugural members of that group are all here in the audience tonight, actually. Uh, that's amazing. So, well, that's, that's a really good takeaway, I think, for all of us. So I've been noticing on Instagram that you're getting on Penobscot Island Air and leaving the island. So, you know, we've been waiting for you to leave the island for state service for a while now. Yeah. And, um, and so why now? What, it, what, what was the, what, are we at a, what's going on that would cause you to make a major decision in your life like this? Uh, it's a good question. So, I mean, I was not necessarily gearing up or lobbying for this job. Right. Um, my friend Janet Mills ran for governor and um, as did a lot of other great people run for, ran for governor and she, she won and asked me to be on her transition team. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a lot of November and December trying to find great commissioner candidates uh, for her to consider, which was a great project and a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the more sucked in I got, the more involved I got in some of the issues. And, and she asked me if I'd want to work part time on some blah, blah, blah issues. And then it's turned into something larger than I anticipated. But it's, um, I couldn't say no because it was a great mm -hmm. offer. So, um, you know, it's hard. I have ki kids who are six and seven, and luckily I have a great husband who's good at cooking. And um, you have a great. I husband. think it was earlier this week. I Tuesday morning. I was supposed to be in Augusta and had all these meetings and had to do something with the governor. And we had somebody on the island go into labor, so the ferry was canceled that morning. So I had to fly off with Penobscot Island Air, and uh, then of course my, I was going to take my car on the ferry that morning. So I didn't have a car when I got to Rockland. So Rex the plumber and all the other people on the plane, the mail plane, gave me a ride to Enterprise, rent a car, because they had <laughs> rental cars. And then I got to Enterprise and they only had a cargo van. So I luckily was able to exchange it when I got to Augusta, but yeah. yeah. So it's the logistics of island life are not always that cool. <laughs> That's a fantastic story, Hannah. Well, so I think, you know, for many of us, part of the hope is that with this, with with Governor Mills and and with you in your in your office, that that there's the opportunity to address a number of kind of tipping point issues for this state. I guess would you say that the state is at a tipping point, and if so, kind of how? Yes, I mean, I would say that um, you know, without going into a lot of the past, that we've there are so many significant issues for our state. Climate change, mm -hmm. um, demographic challenges, workforce challenges, business opportunities that the state really has an incredible opportunity with, mm -hmm. um, educational challenges. So we are at a point where I think there's a lot of need for leadership and change, and there are a lot of issues that are incredibly crucial that we start acting on now, I mean, we should have started a couple years ago. Um, so I think that uh, it's a point where the governor has incredibly, she has lofty and important goals, and I think the legislature has a lot of uh, great legislators with many, many ideas. So now, now our challenge is to really channel all of that demand and need and the need for change into action. And, mm -hmm. and that's hard. I mean, it's not, it can't all easily be done, you know, in the next couple months, but it, we're trying to figure out how to start that and start yeah. making the right steps forward. There's a bunch of ways I could go here. I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about from where I'm sitting at the Institute is to say, kind of, I've, I've lived for years now wishing for a greater opportunity for the nonprofit sector to more actively partner with state government around some of their priorities that we all share. Um, can you talk about where you see opportunities for partnership in the various sectors in the state so we can advance what are, in my mind, some extraordinarily ambitious agenda items? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
probably every arena of state government has, they have industries, they have constituents, they have nonprofits working on the same issues. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we don't partner, we are just wasting time and energy. I mean, the issue of climate change, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, the governor said, all right, we've done enough studies, we've done enough reports, mm -hmm. now is the time for action. And I will say that over the last number of years, a lot of nonprofits in the state of Maine and a lot of other groups and businesses really have stepped up to take the lead. And so now I think the, the, the need is to partner and figure mm -hmm. out, all right, what great ideas have you come up with? What resources and ideas do you have? What work are you mm -hmm. already doing at the community level that the state can help enhance? And I, and I really, I can't think of any part of state government where that's not, not the case. But clearly there are a number of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, climate change, workforce, education issues. I mean, they all have opportunities for partnership. I mean, I, and, and how do you do that? I mean, that, that's the harder question. I mean, I think talking to each other, figuring out what are you doing, what are we doing, how can the state really enhance what is already needing to happen. I mean, I think in many cases, the state needs to take the lead, but the work needs to be done by more than just state government. State government is much smaller than it used to be, even staff-wise, um, and you know that's something where these partnerships, smart people helping to inform commissioners, policy staff on where we go, that's how that can happen. Just a, a thought on that from where I'm sitting, and you can take it or leave it. I know you will. <laughs> the, uh, the way that I've tended to experience some of the best partnerships have been where the nonprofit sector in particular, at least, can pilot certain ways of solving problems. So whether it's- Weatherization. The, well, yeah, island workforce housing, weatherization, working waterfront preservation, those are all different major issues. They don't go away. They will be here for a long time. And we're fortunate that the state has programs we can now work on back, we can talk about again and try to refund. Yeah. But I found that uh, it's been, was always been at its best when when we could work with the state on piloting the, piloting the solution and then working with the agencies on how to structure the systemic level, um, meet, meet the gap that we know exists in society yeah. as a result of those pilot projects. Yeah. So if we could formalize those kinds of relationships, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah, and, and honestly, the nonprofit community does a lot of the work. I mean, healthcare sector it is mostly <clears throat> State government is creating the policy and the direction and the nonprofit sector is doing the work, but a lot of the issues you work on are ones where the pilot potential, mm -hmm. helping to do the work. Uh, what, do you, what do you want us to do? What do I want you to do? I mean, the nonprofit so sector. I, I actually think one of the most helpful ways that we could work together has to do with, particularly with the, the incredible agency level leadership that's been developed. There's, I think, a, an opportunity for us to bring the work that we've done, the evidence of solutions to the state, but also if there are ways to share, and by this by share, I mean have a, allow the nonprofit sector to contribute resources, financial resources, human resources to the state's agenda. Yeah. Because I think we have a tremendous workforce. One in six Mainers are in the nonprofit sector as employees. Uh, we have a tremendous economic um, contribution that we make each year, and I, I, I don't want to speak for all nonprofits, but certainly in our case, there have been instances where it would be fantastic for, for us to be able to partner with the state to fund um, pilot programs that the state needs to figure out. Where, where our strategic alignment matches, um, I think we could extend our impact exponentially, yeah. because we have access to, the, to resources that the state can't get access to, and they're often far more flexible than the resources the state can get access to. Well, all I can say is that the governor, I'm sure, likes that idea. I mean, she's already <laughs> been talking about, you know, how, how do we, I mean, first of all, Maine has left a lot of federal funds on the table right. for a variety of programs and pilot opportunities. Um, but there, I mean, in the past, the state had incredible partnerships with foundations to do right. pilot programs with, with nonprofits. And obviously, I'm sure there's some ethical considerations, but in general, the, the idea that, that the nonprofit sector or the foundation sector would want to help pilot innovative ideas, that's awesome. I mean, we could be doing a lot more. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. I hope that that works out. <laughs> we, uh, we... Are, you, are you offering, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, one of the things we've heard about today is the importance of looking at the future of the Maine coast, and I'm sure of all of Maine as a more diverse, welcoming place where we're attracting families as well as keeping the families that want to be here. Uh, and I, I also have a daughter who's 14 who wears her favorite baseball cap says feminist. Nice. And uh, she's trying to figure out her role in society going forward. She has a great consciousness. And I know that you've dedicated your career to really figuring out how to place women in decision-making roles in every level of society. What's your vision for how we can work together to build a more diverse coast of Maine? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a good big question. I mean, first of all, I think I am ex incredibly excited to work for this governor whose entire message, I mean, I think one of her core messages of her inaugural was welcome home and just this idea that Maine is a welcoming state and that could mean a lot of things like mm -hmm. people from away have some good ideas and we should be nicer. Uh, <laughs> You know, new, new businesses that want to come to our state are incredibly important to our economy. Our state desperately needs younger people to move here. There is really no other way around that the demographic and workforce challenge without in-migration, whether that's mm -hmm. people from other countries, immigrants, people from Massachusetts <laughs> or New Hampshire. I think the most people who move to Maine are actually from Massachusetts. Um, Oh my goodness, uh, there are cameras rolling, Hannah. I'm not running for any local offices right now. <laughs> not on the ballot. Um, so uh, I think that all of, I mean, Maine will die without that, I, I think without that spirit and attitude that we need mm -hmm. to be welcoming. And I mean, I, clearly the same is true for, for women and obviously, I know Pat Kelleher is out here somewhere. Where is he? Um, when, when he was named, it was like one of the first men who'd been named to the Mills cabinet. So um, there are and, men. And you almost named him last. Yeah. I was thinking like. <laughs> there, are, there are men in the, in the Mills cabinet, so she's welcoming even to men um, to, be, to be part of her administration. We need to say who he is. Some people may not know. Sorry. Pat Kelleher is the commissioner of the Department of Marine Resources. So it's good to see him here. Um, and, uh, and he worked for Republicans, so the Republicans are welcome. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I, I think that, that that is the other thing that Maine does not have. I mean, I think we are now the whitest state in the country. I mean, mm -hmm. it was sort of back and forth with Vermont, but I think we may be the least diverse. And that is not good. I mean, it's, it's Maine needs diversity. It needs to be welcoming. Um, it needs to look... It will look different in the future, I hope, if it's going to be vibrant. So that is, you know, I think a lot of that does start with that message that the governor is putting out there that we need to be welcoming. Mm -hmm. Change is possible. And without it, our economy and our future and our demographics are, are not positive. I mean, we have 12,500 babies born in Maine every year. And we have 24,000 people turn 65. So we need to welcome more people to Maine. Do you, let's see, I'm kind of, I'm curious, the idea that Maine could be a tolerant place, a welcoming place, is something that has, I've really struggled with. Um, I've certainly been welcomed over time. You know, it's taken a while. <laughs> but, it, but at the same time, I, when, I, when I spend time in island communities, I see a tremendous level of tolerance for everybody that's there. Yeah. Maybe a lot of concern that the next person off the boat's going to say, I want to stay. But for the people <laughs> are there, it's tremendous tolerance. And, and so do you think there's something in that that we could focus on and say, hey, look, we already have a characteristic that predisposes us to maybe getting along well with others? Did you hear about what they said about you after you left? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, mean Maine, I live in a very small town. I'm sure many people in this audience do. I mean, right. Maine is... It's not an easy place to move, especially our very <clears throat> smallest towns and islands. I mean, it's, it is very welcoming and people can be nice, but they're also 
it takes a while mm -hmm. to work your way in. And I, I have seen it over the course of even my lifetime that the community I live in has become, there's more people coming and going. It is more welcoming, but it's still not easy. And maybe it will never be easy, and mm -hmm. certainly the most remote places are not easy to live. Um, I, I do think ultimately the people who come to Maine realize that these are communities where people pay attention to each other. Mm -hmm. So once you start to, you know, figure out how to, that everybody already knows you in, yeah. on that island before you even got there. And um, it's, you start to adjust to that. I, generally, that, that spirit and attitude can make Maine and our communities wonderful, but it, mm -hmm. it can also be very challenging yeah. um, for, for new people. E even our cities are very challenging for new people. And that is, that is something that I think is probably not unique to Maine, but Maine it's, it's not like every place you go in the country. Some places right. constantly have people coming and going, and that's much more normal. Mainers are, are very suspect of that. So you said earlier that, and I, I really do like the governor's motto, welcome home. And I've been very focused on the motto, work at home, which is something that can only be accomplished through high-speed broadband. And so I'm curious about the governor's. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about the governor's priority for broadband, and uh, since you have the future in your title, hopefully it includes broadband. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say that that is one of the number one things she said she wanted to work on, and one of the issues that, that we are starting to focus on. The Commissioner of Economic and Community Development actually came from a broadband background. Um, mm -hmm. She ran the Connect Me Authority, and it it's an issue that needs a lot of attention and work. It is not... Unfortunately, the more you delve into it, it's not easily solved. It's an issue that requires uh, really pushing carriers harder. It requires millions and millions of dollars. It requires hopefully federal support for that work. Um, it requires being more creative about how we use the networks that are already happening in Maine to our schools and libraries. Um, you know, even this new Central Maine power line that's very controversial. Uh, there are components of that if it goes forward that would bring a much larger trunk of internet into Maine. So it, it needs to be an all hands on deck, you know, uh, approach to this. And it is not, I mean, unfortunately, there are problems even in bigger cities that need to be solved. And those probably can be solved with more pressure by both state government and industry. Mm -hmm. But the challenge for rural communities, I mean, my community has actually okay internet most places, but there's a few roads, like four miles down the dirt road, and there's three people on that road. They're very expensive problems to solve. And the yeah. island is too, I mean, you guys have been working on that. Um, and you know that it's like baby steps. So yeah. I, I think that I would say it's an area where the state needs a clearer funding priority and strategy and some creative strategies, but it is still an issue that's gonna require communities to come together and in some places help solve the problem with us because I don't think just because a new governor believes in it, it's gonna, ha it's gonna immediately go to every small community in Maine. And a lot of communities like the Cranberry Isles right. worked really hard to figure out how to do it. And unfortunately, a lot of communities are gonna have to keep working hard to solve that, that problem. Well, I'm, my hope is that if we, could even, if we can get better alignment at the federal level be between the FCC and the USDA, that'll help. But I also think it's an area where I do think it's an area where the Island Institute really is eager to partner. I think it's a place where there are some great organizations, an emerging strong coalition of private, nonprofit sector interests, and I do think we can solve the problem for the state, even though it is expensive to solve for Maine, it seems imperative, particularly if we want to attract people. Yeah, and we have businesses. I mean, it's one of, it's one of the top issues at the ag conference this year. I mean, farmers in Maine, a lot of farming requires technology, both selling products, but also farm equipment. And so um, it's every industry in Maine mm -hmm. requires the internet to some degree. I mean, fishermen are using it and they need better cell phone service. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue where our, the world and our lives are requiring high speed internet. So yeah. for Maine to not fall <clears throat> far, far behind, we need to figure out we will probably never be in the lead, but we need to figure out how to catch up. So a, a colleague of mine, Scott Planting with Seacoast Mission is here today. And I know that one of the things they work very hard on is making sure that people can show up well in their community, spiritually, health, 
in all the ways that you need to in order to contribute to the success of your community. And I know Maine is struggling terribly with the opioid crisis right now. So I, I, I believe you mentioned that that is part of the, of the portfolio of your work. And so I was just wondering what your thoughts were about what can be done about that. Um, it's a great question. So I am, uh, my, my new office, which is, let's just say it's called the Office of Policy and Management, um, which was an office that Governor LePage created after he got rid of the state planning office. We are going to turn into the Office of Policy Innovation in the future. And there are two employees. Uh, there are going to be more, but right now it's me and Gordon Smith. And Gordon is a longtime medical leader in the state. He ran the Maine Medical Association, and he is now the state opioid response coordinator. And he is just, this man is working all the time, having community forums, working with hospitals, working with mental health facilities, trying to figure out how to open beds. And similar to the governor's theme, welcome home, I think the, the most important thing that both the governor and Gordon are out there doing is saying, this is something we all need to talk about and address. We need to understand the science, we need to understand the medicine, we need to encourage the right kind of treatment, which is mm -hmm. often medication, which was not encouraged under the former administration, and we need to put resources and money and attention into it. And mm -hmm. so Gordon really, he, it's his, his full time and life mission right now to work mm -hmm. on this issue with, I mean, there are obviously thousands of people around Maine who are struggling with this. Um, and. I sit next to Gordon and I hear him on the phone and he's literally talking to people, helping them get their children into the right facility and then talking to the, the hospital, how do you get some more beds open and the governor, how do we get more millions of dollars thrown at treatment? So it's really, I mean, that's he's taking the lead on it, but a lot of it is about our state just being more public, that this is something that almost has touched almost every family or every community in Maine. Uh, we need to make sure it's something that we're open about and that we understand that treatment is possible, but it's hard work and people need support. Thank you. We have one more question before we'll go to the audience. Uh, what I was wondering, and this was brought up at, at, during the break, given the range of important subjects that the administration has to deal with and the scope of your office, how do you focus initially? What is your initial high priority? And how, how do you begin to invest appropriately in that? So the governor has given us, um, our, our, our goal is to focus on the issues that require multiple parts of state government to come together and work together. Mm -hmm. And so there are issues that don't live in any one department, but issues that require kind of big thinking, bringing people together, and then not giving up after one legislative session. Kind of long-term, <laughs> let's keep this thing going. Wow, um, long-term planning. <clears throat> long-term planning. And so um, the, the issues right now that we're focused on are, Gordon is, is focused on opioids. Um, we're working on early childhood ed education, which is really bringing together um, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education mm -hmm. um, around helping our youngest citizens really get a better start. Um, we're focused on climate, which is an issue that really crosses every department of state government, every community in Maine. Can I just pause and say how incredibly grateful I am that we're finally talking about climate change at the state level? Yeah. Uh, climate and the energy solutions that come along with that. Um, and then the issues of both workforce development, um, rural economic development, and broadband. So uh, that was more than one. <laughs> well, they're 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 together. They're all kind of I'm combined in their their the economy. Um, so <laughs> we're going to hire some talented staff people to Great. help me. I'm obviously not going to do this alone. Um, and but there are issues that the governor ran on. She feels are important, mm -hmm. um, and they're the is issues where we have great commissioners who sort of want to come together to help us work. Great. Well, we're, we have time here to take some questions from the audience. And what I thought we would do is just have folks raise their hands. We have some microphones placed around the room that will need to make their way to you. So if anyone has a question for Hannah, please do raise your hand. There's one over here. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the uh, energy solutions that you see. As you know, your island and the greater island to the south that uh, we live on went together to put up some windmills. It hasn't been the smoothest um, 
path, as you know, but what do you see for the state? Um, yes, that windmill project was, was an, I mean, I, I still am very proud to have been a part of that. As, so am I. As is Rob, and I can <laughs> see them from my house, and um, they generate still more electricity than North Haven and Vinyl Haven use. So we built that back in 2008, 2009, and um, the, the, the climate solutions are kind of an all hands on deck approach. Um, I mean, the things that Maine, I, I think we're gonna start doing soon are one, we need to work with the New England states and the rest of the country that are trying to work on these issues together. Um, state government needs to take the lead. Um, you know, the way we drive, the way we uh, use electricity in the buildings, uh, you know, the way we, um, even our work patterns. So that's something the governor's focused on. She's putting solar panels on the roof um, of the Blaine House. Uh, then, I mean, the, the, the big solutions are uh, really focused on energy. And the electricity mix is something that we're working on this legislative session. Um, she has a goal of 80% uh, renewable energy for the state by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Um, that's sort of, unfortunately, that's the easier part of, of lowering carbon emissions. Um, from there, you know, the transportation sector and the heating sector are where our state needs to focus. And so um, those are things that we'll be putting out legislation on this year, the kind of starting gate, but transportation is a really hard one. Um, she actually, the governor, um, was successful in the VW settlement and getting a lot of money for Maine to start putting into charging infrastructure. Um, we're trying to figure out how to encourage more EVs for community organizations and even the state. Um, but that's sort of tip of the iceberg kind of activity. Um, there, the housing, housing is really sort of the next bucket. Weatherization and efficiency, something Alan Institute's been working on for a long time. I mean, we need to take that out to rural Maine in a much more significant way. And so that's, that's the focus um, of the governor. Um, you know, from there, one of the things that she's gonna do, I believe, is, is you know, start talking about it publicly, listening to scientists, and holding ourselves accountable for what we said we're going to do. So um, in the coming months, I would, I would look for announcements on, on how we convene in a more official way as a state to recognize the problem, set goals of how we're gonna start trying to meet our goals on the carbon emission side, and then you know, reporting regularly to the public on how are we doing. Um, that's only one side. The other side is obviously how are we gonna adapt. And you know, that's the Commissioner of Marine Resources, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Forestry, um, IFNW, I was just talking to that commissioner. Every community in Maine, it's, it's planning, it's thinking about how industry is gonna change, how our economy is gonna change, and that's really hard work. I mean, that's not something that we're gonna do in the next year or so. So um, starting to talk about what adaptation means to Maine and how we start planning for it, I mean, that, that is a big piece of work that's gonna, I think, involve many industries in our whole state coming together. So. Um, that's, that's the beginning. I think that one of the things the governor is committed to doing is going around the state and even listening to ideas. Um, clearly, there are a lot of states ahead of Maine in this work, and we're already looking at what they're doing and, and how we can start that work. Um, Maine is a relatively you know, rural state and poor state, so figuring out how to do those, those things in a, in, a, um, in a smart way so they're not impacting low-income people and that people can be part of the solution, that, that's another challenge, but something that's important, so. Here. Hold on one second, we're gonna get a mic for you. You have an admirably ambitious uh, list of goals. Um, I would encourage also innovation in finance, uh, because the deployment and capital is gonna be a lot of what this is all about. So public-private partnerships, uh, various credit schemes, whatever you can yeah. to do to bring private sector dollars to these efforts, yeah. uh, we're out here. All of them or climate? And beyond. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, and that, that is incredibly um, important. I mean, many states have been a lot more innovative in financing, especially on the clean energy side, and Maine is way behind that eight ball, so. I see Ben Martens in the back. Ben, Maine Coast Fishermen's Thanks. Association. Hassan. Uh, so there's a lot of 
talk about change and looking to that future. And uh, with that change comes the discussions between what current uses look like and how we are going to bring everybody to the table to have those discussions about whether it's development along our working waterfront or wind energy out on the ocean and our current users and the stress that those communities are starting to feel about those things. How do you foresee the government uh, and our state kind of bringing people together to try and have real conversations about the stress and the change that people are already starting to feel um, with everything you've been talking about today in this room? That's a good question. I mean, there's no, no easy solution to that problem. I mean, uh, we've all probably attended planning board meetings or controversial meetings. I mean, I think one of the things that the state needs to encourage is conversations and planning. And that's been happening in a proactive way in some communities about what do we want and where do we want it. Um, but it's something where I think the, most towns are operating on pretty old models of, of planning. Um, I mean, there, there's no easy solution. I mean, there's always people who are going to be against this industry and their community or that wind turbine um, or e even those solar panels. Um, so I think we as a state just need to set priorities for what we want to encourage and how we want to encourage it, hopefully with the support of the majority of the people in our state, and then try to be consistent about that support. Um, I, I don't think there's any silver bullet. I mean, when you start thinking about some climate planning and sea level rise planning, there's, there are, I mean, you think about downtowns that will be impacted and there are incredibly complicated factors of how you prioritize and how you come up with the funding to move things and what happens to people's businesses or wharves or the sewer treatment plant. So I, I obviously, all we can do now is start to figure out how to carefully think about those issues so that we have a long-term plan, um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it will always be smooth, but hopefully by talking about it, prioritizing, and, and doing more proactive planning, at least we can try to head in a better direction. I'm just gonna add, I'd like to add one thing to that. Sure. Uh, if I might, just that one of the things that I've really been hoping for to see more of out of state government is to lead in those hardest situations and to be clear about what's best for the state. Um, and I think that's, that because I think often um, there are certainly, when you get to a, some scales of project, it does pit community against community and neighbor against neighbor. And there are, there are situations where uh, no, amount of, no amount of talking will necessarily get to what's right for the, the whole. Yeah. And that's really hard when we're in those situations, I think the, the challenges the lobster industry faces in particular yep. make it hard with such a, a large base with such a diverse point of view on everything. Yeah, I was going to say, I was actually going to point out poor Pat again. I mean, <laughs> he is a good example of people. You just have to state the science and talk about the planning and what needs to happen right. and listen to everybody, but then make a decision. And some those decisions are, are incredibly difficult. I mean, as Very you just said, difficult. in the lobster industry and... They will be difficult as we go out, but yeah. there can be positive that come, can come from these things as well. I was wondering if you could tell if you're the, person, the right person to be talking about this, the student loan situation and some, um, I, heard, I heard that they were going to be talking about giving some student loan help and encouraging people to move here, the young people moving to Maine and what you could tell us about that. I, can't, I don't profess to be an expert on that, and that is not in my area at this point. Um, Maine does have an, a program called Opportunity Maine, um, which that was the point to try to help with some student loan forgiveness. It has not been that successful, so there's a bill in the legislature to try to change it and to do exactly as you said. Um, there's a group of legislators working on it. The Commissioner of Education is focused on it. Um, FAME in Maine, just the financing authority, has worked on that issue. So not, I, I don't know everything. And that is one where I know it's a challenge. Um, and clearly, we want to attract young people. So it's a challenge that we should be proactive about. Ethan? Mr. Mayor. How are you, Madam Speaker? Uh, Ethan Strimling, Mayor of Portland. We in Portland uh, are often struggling with balancing our working waterfront, with trying to keep a diverse base down there so there's an economy going with 
uh, overdevelopment that's coming in. And I'm curious, you know, your experience, sort of any thoughts or insights you have for us about how to make sure we really can preserve that marine-based working waterfront um, through, our, through our piers and our wharfs. Yeah. I mean, I think that Portland's challenge is like a, a much more high-profile version of what many island communities have faced. I mean, uh, I'd say Rob and the Island Institute and CEI and lots of others have been working on this for so many years. The, the, the idea that of our very long coastline, how much of it is actually devoted to working waterfront is tiny. And that really is true in almost every fishing community in Maine. And I think we just need to be I mean, this is a, often a community issue, but where the state has partnered in the past with the Working Waterfronts Program to figure out how do we preserve those for the long term. And I mean, we may see, we've already seen changes in the southern Maine lobster industry, for example, but aquaculture, potentially new fisheries in the future, we need to keep this real estate for, for future potential fishing opportunities and working opportunities. So, I mean, I think that, that Portland was very proactive in, in preserving um, working waterfront in the past through through zoning, and I think as that working waterfront declined, it was harder to hold on to it. So, mayoral leadership is what I would say is important. <laughs> <laughs> and and the governor, she she can help. Annie. Hi, Hannah. Hey, um, Annie. So you spoke about workforce development. Um, the lobster industry has a number of challenges. They're not just scientific. They're not just on the water. Um, we have some major challenges in the supply chain, and one of them is, a, is adequate workforce. And it's not just for people that are processing lobster or packing lobsters. It's for sales positions. It's logistics. These are management positions. Um, I know that this industry is not unique to the state of Maine. I just saw today that Her Terry Hayes was hired by Hospitality Maine to help with their workforce development. Workforce is a huge issue. It, it also stands to really benefit, uh, especially places like rural Hancock and Washington counties, because the majority of the lobster comes out of there, and we've got some substantial infrastructure down there. The closure of the Down East Correctional Facility had a huge impact on some of our lobster businesses that were sourcing workforce on, um, through a work release program. Um, we've, we've tried to do some creative things. We're doing a training program with corrections right now. Um, we're, we're stuck because our businesses are no longer able to source workforce through the temporary foreign worker program due to the fact that the H2B visa program has been decimated. Um, so we're really looking to the state for some help in this, in this process in these very, very challenging labor times. Yeah. I mean, I th I'd say the, the workforce is clearly an issue that the governor's heard, that my office, Department of Economic and Community Development, but really all of state government is focused on. Um, the Commissioner of Labor, obviously sort of her top priority is to focus on workforce issues. I mean, the, the, the hard thing is, is there is no easy solution. It's sort of one of Maine's greatest challenges. And the business community has been creative and proactive. I mean, obviously, federal policy change would help. That's not something that, that looks like it will be easily accomplished right now, but hopefully in the future, that could be helpful. I mean, I think, Part of it is Maine being a more welcoming state. I mean, we do have immigrant communities coming to Maine and figuring out how to get them into the workforce and train them for jobs. Um, I'm sure many people have heard about the statistic of 18 to 24 year olds in Maine, you know, the many thousands who are not in the workforce. That's not an easily solved problem, but figuring out how to job training programs that are incredibly creative because so far they haven't, they haven't worked with that population. Um, I just had somebody pitch me on the number of people over 65, 65 to 75, who are no longer in the workforce, who, might, who sh could probably be more attra easily attracted back into the workforce with some creative programs. Um, so I think in a lot of the communities where the, there are workforce needs, there are major housing challenges. Um, so I actually think the, that housing and workforce really fit together. So um, that is something that, that I know the state is focused on, the city of Portland is struggling with, but so is the town of North Haven. Um, so I think that that is something that I think we should all be talking about more is housing because people just can't live near some of these jobs right now and, and that's part of the challenge. So I'd like to give you an opportunity. We're at the end of our time and I'm very curious what what do you think is the most important thing for everybody in this audience to take away today? 
takeaway, most important thing. Um, I guess the, the most important thing I would say, uh, I have a lot of friends and colleagues in, the, in this audience who are excited to work with us. Um, I promise to return your emails. I've gotten a few too many in the last couple weeks. Um, but actually, I think to, to keep pushing state government to, and your legislator and the governor to, to continue to do the things that we're all excited about, um, maybe have a little patience in that pushing. Um, but I do think that being a part of, of the solution is, is, I think this governor and I think my office, we're trying to think of creative ways to involve the nonprofit sector, the public, funders in exactly what those solutions are going to be. Um, the other thing I would say is I think we all need to take a climate lens on <laughs> our lives, uh, in our businesses, in our communities. And I think um, while the state is going to start being much more proactive on this issue, a lot of it does come down to community planning. It comes down to how are you running your own business and your own home. Um, and we can move forward on these issues in a more successful way with a lot more, not what is the state doing, but what are we all doing um, mm -hmm. on that challenge? I can't tell you, uh, yes. <laughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am that you've decided to make this transition at this time. I know I speak for everybody here when I say that you're giving us all tremendous hope. and. I think we need it, and we have a lot of work to do, and we're going to be able to get there with your tenacity, your leadership, and your vision. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks.